Welcome to episode 197 of Tim Talk, the podcast about the DC animated universe co-created by Bruce Tim. I'm Chris Lord. And at the moment, we are but two humble, bumbling, dare I say a little childish idiots with a podcast. But, but, I have discovered a magic word that will transform us from mere mortals into godlike beings who possess the wisdom of Solomon, the strength of Hercules, the stamina of Atlas, the power of Zeus, the courage of Achilles, and finally the speed of Mercury. So when I say the magic word, get ready for a full-on she's all that style transformation. Three, two, one, Shazam! Huh, maybe it needs to warm up a little bit. Shazam! Shazam! Shit. Um, okay, well, it looks like I get some bad intel, uh, so until then, we'll just have to settle for being vaxxed, waxed, and ready to cast as we dive into this week's episodes, including one that features, you guessed it, the magical catchphrase shouting hero, Captain Marvel, a.k.a. Shazam. And, and I'm Cameron Dexter. <laughs> that was good. I, I was mouthing along the, the words. You were. I, I will admit I had to look them up. That's uh, fair. That's fine. I know you would have them off the top of your head. Yes. <laughs> so, and I figured why not deny you an opportunity to once again utilize your encyclopedic knowledge of all things Greek history. Mm-hmm. Yes. Thank you. Yes. How are you, Chris? Uh, I am Happy jet lagged. Happy 197. <laughs> I am very jet lagged. Uh, and a little bit tired this morning. Can't hey, we, how, me too. How are you doing? I'm just dandy. <laughs> I lost uh, six pounds on sweat yesterday. Uh, and from... I gained 10 pounds from pina coladas in Hawaii this last week. Congratulations. The <laughs> so... world the world is a funny place like that, isn't it? It really is. Yeah. You're, you're, why don't you tell the audience real quickly uh, what you did yesterday that you're so exhausted? Oh, yes. Uh, yesterday was my five-year anniversary of my boxing gym. Uh, well I've, done, congratulations! Thank you, thank you. It has been my like pillar of sanity for for five years, outside of this podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, this hasn't contributed to your sanity in any no no meaningful no, 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 way. No, no, if no, anything, no. it's it's the opposite. Right, just threats on my life, bombs implanted in my head. Yep, you know, <laughs> it's still there, by the way. <laughs> yeah, future Chris is coming in just to ruin <laughs> things. Uh, no, to celebrate my five year, I took every single class offered in a day, so I worked out for five hours straight mm-hmm. uh, against. Every one of my friends' uh, best judgments, and I stupidly ignored all of them. Uh, and now <laughs> my body is numb. But what is more you than that? Exactly. <laughs> so. I, I had to because I had people commenting like, "Oh wow, Cameron, that's inc- that's incredible! Like that that's so like inspiring." I'm like, I'm not a role model. I'm just dumb. <laughs> one time I tried to work out, I like, do a full boxing workout in a wool sweater for a bit uh, over Christmas. Uh, and I'm like, I am stupid. <laughs> Don't follow me. I'm not an example. <laughs> well, who am I to judge you for committing to asinine bits? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so. uh, but then you've also <laughs> decided to go to Disneyland today. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to Disney after this, too. <laughs> after this. Uh, so this will be the first time I try and seek out where you can get a wheelchair. <laughs> Oh, so for both a little bit uh, more gravelly than normal today, uh, that that is why Cameron from his intense workout and me from uh, a five hour flight yesterday, and uh, it being six a.m. my time. Great, currently. So, but hey, you know we roll with it. Uh, but yes, we are back. We are talking this week about uh, Clash and Hunter's Moon. Yes. So as we mentioned at the top of the show, we're going to be talking a little bit about Captain Marvel this week, which is going to be fun. I'm excited. I'm excited as well, because this is when he's still Captain Marvel and not an unnamed superhero who can't call himself Shazam because he'll transform out of his heroic state. Right. Right. <laughs> so, uh, but shall we just uh, get straight into it here? Let's jump on into it, man. All right. So, in Clash, after a recently recruited leaguer Captain Marvel accidentally endorses Lex Luthor for president, Superman gives Marvel a stern warning and uh, shows that he is anything but objective when it comes to Lex. So when Lex invites Superman to the opening of his new sustainable low-income housing city, Lexor City, Superman suspects that Lex's new kryptonite-powered fusion reactor is actually a deadly bomb and starts to tear apart the city with only the naive but godlike Captain Marvel standing in his way. It's a good episode. It's incredible. It's And it's a big episode in the Cadmus arc as well, because this is the one where we finally get confirmation that Lex is, in fact, the is bankrolling slash contributing to the Cadmus. 
plot. It's been suspected up to this point, but here we get full on mustache twirling Lex at the very end. And I, this this is great. I mean, I think their their portrayal of uh, Captain Marvel, brilliantly voiced by Jerry O'Connell, fantastic choice in their part. Um, he is such an interesting counterpoint to Superman, who normally is, you know, much more like the lighthearted, fun-loving one. And this one, he's just kind of a bitter old dickhole all the way through, isn't he? Yeah. Mm. But, I mean, this also episode also has a really fantastic start to the whole thing. Which is, like, I feel like we're starting to see a lot more of this now, where the episodes just will kind of jump in, in media res, into a fight between the League and a bunch of villains, mm-hmm. which is kind of fun. When you This is this is a, a long-time question for me, mm-hmm. and I'm hoping at least one listener, so I'm not the only dumb one. Uh, when you say in media res... What does that mean? What does that mean? I have no idea. All I know is it means you jump into the middle of the action. Got it. Okay. Yes. I, I know... Let me put it this way. I know what it means, but not what it comes from got it okay uh but here it means that we jump into a fight uh where parasite has been taking on members of the league so he's already incapacitated uh elongated man and now he's working his way towards taking out metamorpho and once that happens it's just left to batman to try and stop him um and for some reason i thought i remember him like throwing some sort of i don't know chemically enhanced batarang that disabled him but no he basically just stalling time until he can get someone to come in and help. And he actually even asked, asked John for help. And John's like, wait a minute. You you never ask for help. What is going on I know, here? John is also stalling and just kind of <laughs> rubbing it in. Because he could come down. That's true. He Yeah, and he... Uh, ooh, see that, oh, that's an interesting question. Like, how do you decide who to send in a fight up against Parasite? Yeah. I mean, obviously they... The idea is that they would send in Superman who's fought with him before, so I guess you knows kind of the tricks of the trade. But, like, you would have to be kind of cautious who you send. Because even as it is, sending Metamorpho kind of makes sense, but also you run the risk of Parasite absorbing Metamorpho's powers, which he does. Mm-hmm. And Metamorpho is incredibly powerful because he can be, I don't know, whatever fucking element he wants to be. I mean, it's the last thing you probably want is for Jean to be touched by Parasite. Because then Parasite's going to have all of Jean's insane abilities. Right. But then also you could just take him out with a book of matches. So That is true. They also uh, absorb the weaknesses. Uh, so uh, maybe, maybe. So, question on that. Yeah. If Parasite had touched Captain Marvel, what would happen if he said Shazam? Oh. Would he turn into Kid Parasite? <laughs> <laughs> or would he just lose the powers, I guess? That is a really good... I feel like he would just lose the powers. That is a really good... Oh, see, that actually is interesting because would Parasite absorb powers that are granted to someone rather than inherent in them, right? So it's like Superman's powers are inherent in his being. I don't know where Elongated Man got his powers, but it's not like he he gains them through some device or magic or something like that. He just has them all the time. So he has metamorpho. But yeah, like, for example, if he were to touch Wonder Woman, I suppose he would get some of her inherent Themyscirin strength. Mm -hmm. But he wouldn't necessarily get, like, the power of her bracelets. Although I feel like, didn't didn't Amazo end up copying the bracelets? Yeah, Amazo got little. It's a little bit uh, confusing there. But Amazo is different, because he didn't, because he's, like, self, self growing. That's true. Where yeah. Parasite's absorbing. Yeah, that's true cuz like Amazo also takes on the the mace. Mm-hmm. Just went, yeah, so I guess ooh, that's a good question. Yeah, like I don't think he would because the power of Shazam is granted to a being. So yeah, would he just turn into a kid? <laughs> that would suck. Yeah, that would really suck. <laughs> well, yeah, cuz I'm thinking just kind of all magic now, like if he touches Atana, I don't think he would get her spells i think he might get her like inherent magic abilities yeah but he wouldn't know how to use them because all because everything around her magic is 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 word based is spell based yeah he would absorb her talents yeah but not necessarily her knowledge yeah but i guess but but don't but doesn't he also absorb the memories 
when he touches someone. Oh, that is true. Yeah, so like he would absorb, he would know all of the spells to cast, just in the same way that I think he he briefly knew that Superman and Clark Kent were one of the same. Right. right. Wasn't that a thing? That sounds right. Yeah. So like oh, you, yeah, because then he got like buried in a volcano or something. Some oh, who can remember? It's been years since we no, covered. That was, no, I think that was um, that was Metallo, Metallo who got buried in a volcano. That's yeah, right. Um, and then lost his memory for a little bit. But yeah, like if he had touched Batman, he would get Batman's fighting techniques, but also his like strategy and his knowledge on how to use all that sort of stuff. But <laughs> stock market tips. Exactly. Right? <laughs> Insider trading. But I think I think you're right. I think one being that he would not gain that much from would be Shazam because I don't think he well, I guess if he touched him, he might know to say the words Shazam, in which case he might actually transform into Shazam. Now I'm confused. I'm also, yeah. I don't know. If anyone out there knows if a specific time when Parasite touched Captain Marvel slash Shazam, what the effects were, please let us know, because we sure as shit don't. Or Etrigan, I feel like would be similar. Oh, yeah. Cursed would, magic. Yeah, would he have to say the, say the phrase, and then mm-hmm. would he become his own version of Etrigan? Oh, this is confusing now. This is fun. I don't know what's happening anymore. Uh, but yeah, so there's a, that fun little fight, and then before Superman can show up, because he's off saving a, a plane a la the... Not the opening, but all uh, um, oh, it's the middle episode of um, Last Son of Krypton, the premiere. Oh, because they did remember he saved the plane. Last Son of Krypton, the very the pilot of Superman the animated series. That's right. Okay, he was catching the plane. Um, yeah, well, I feel like that's like the trope because well, Supergirl does it in the Donners. Doesn't he do it in one of the Donner episode cuts? Um, I don't. I don't think because Supergirl only appears in Supergirl. Yo, yes. Which and, is a spinoff of the Donner of Superman films. And I don't well, remember I mean the, the TV series. I think she saved the plane at some point. I think she might do that in the pilot. Like that is, I, I feel like that might've been one of Superman's introductions. I don't know where it first started. Cause it doesn't returns. He doesn't returns. I know it's all an homage to like his original first introduction or one of his first introductions where he saves a plane, but yeah, he does it in returns. He does it in the last son of Krypton. He does it here. I think you're right. I think Supergirl does it in the pilot for Supergirl. Um, Who is making these planes <laughs> that just constantly have engines bursting? Well, like someone needs to look. Wayne Tech needs to look into this. Yeah, I mean, this that idea is kind of referenced to some degree in some Superman comics. I, I think of um, Superman Red Sun specifically, where Superman makes a comment about how like people don't even bother wearing seatbelts anymore because they know that he'll be there to save them. I, I suspect maybe in this universe, just like the factor of safety on stuff and like the like the like the testing and the quality control is like, ah, if anything goes wrong, we got Superman. Yeah, we got. Yeah, there's three speedsters. Someone yeah, will Superman. Catch us. We got the whole league. It's it's fine. Someone will take care of us. So <laughs> I think this is going on. But it, it's kind of fun, too, because the um, we get a little bit of the, the Superman theme there, the animated series theme when he's saving the plane. And we also get a little bit of the Batman theme. When he's hurling batarangs at parasites, it's a fun little, fun little nod, a little throwback there to the early days of the DCAU. So long ago, <laughs> really was a long time ago. But before Superman can get there, Captain Marvel swoops in and like saves the day, and everyone's like, "Oh yeah, well done, Captain Marvel. You're awesome. We love you." And then a bunch of reporters, including Lois, come up and ask him like, "Oh, what is so inspiring about being in the league?" And he says, "Well, not only are we heroes, but..." We help people. Look what happened with Lex Luthor. He's super villain, and now he's running for president. And that's fine and dandy. Yeah, he never outright endorses Lex. It's no. all just a twist on words. Right. So, but I mean, are we surprised? All these newspapers and their secret agendas. Exactly. <laughs> their, their liberal agendas. Yeah. <laughs> How dare they? Mm-hmm. Except he's running independent. As, as we've established. As we, as, yeah, yeah, we established. Right. He must established be running, last week. He must be running independent. Um, yeah, so it's not really an endorsement. Um, but that's how it, it, it's run. Now, so this isn't all part of Lex's plan. Like, at the end of the day, Lex's plan is he's built this Lexor City, which is this, um, ma- like, this big, new, completely modern, sustainable city that's basically designed specifically to house, um, like, low-income families, the unhoused, like, a home for children who don't have one, basically. It's, like, genuinely good works. And it is powered by a new krypton powered fusion reactor so like it's powered by the fusion of kryptonite molecules um which lex says is why he didn't bother telling superman what it was and why it's lead lined now the reality is this is all a massive setup to just get superman there to have him lex kind of goes off the side and whispers to mercy it's like okay like is everything set okay make sure my escape room is all there just to give superman the tip and then he is going to 
trick Superman into basically like tearing the city apart. What he didn't plan on happening was that Captain Marvel was going to be there and create an actual fight between leaguers and not just a, a bunch of shots Superman tearing up the city. But the tension between Superman and Marvel is built up all the way through. Like from the moment Superman shows up and Marvel has like jumped in to save the day, you can tell Superman is already jealous basically of this guy. I mean, at one point he even has a conversation with Batman. It's like, like, I don't like the guy because he doesn't know he's a kid, presumably at this point. Right. It's like, I don't like the guy. I'm like, what does everyone like him so much? And Batman's like, people just do. He's, he's sunny. Like, you know, he's the new Boy Scout. Yeah. I mean, there, there's a way you can look at this where Superman does see himself in Captain Marvel, but in a sense, it's, it's his early days. Yeah. Where he was also that naive. And right. thought everything was this very easy, clear black and white. Yeah. Yeah, like, Superman was pretty much always skeptical of Lex, but he's now been going up against Lex for years now at this point. I forget the actual timeline is. I'm sure uh, Maddie and James will jump in and, and start yelling at us here. But, I, you know, I would guess five, five plus years, something like that, of them going toe-to-toe. And so he knows better than the trust Lex at anything at this point. You're right, Captain Marvel is naive and and we know that as an audience because he's in fact like a 10 year old kid who can call down these godlike powers but for everybody else he's just a really sunny plucky happy individual yeah you know he goes around the watchtower just like super excited to see everybody and saying hi to everybody and like just fangirling over everyone around him i love because that's how we would react no cameron that's how sorry that's how i would react that's how you would react react. (laughs) okay I'd have a quick draw against Vigilante. <laughs> I'd have an imaginary sword fight with Shining Knight. Yeah. I'd play Rock'em Sock'em Robots with uh, Elongated Man. I was going to say, I think I think at this way we can establish that I hold my professional cool around people that I would normally go nuts over. I could. I've just never <laughs> given the opportunity. Yeah, I've had, I've had multiple opportunities and I've kept it cool. But yeah, like, that's exactly right. Like... He, he, okay, wait, I've never asked you this question. Do you really identify with Captain Marvel because he's basically you? That's a good question. I don't think I'm good enough to be Billy Batson. Because he's just <laughs> so pure. What do you mean? He's such a pure heart. Is he? I think so. I mean, I guess the movie version, not quite so much. Movie, yeah. The movie version's pretty cynical, but. Yeah, because you can't have just an outstanding, perfect person. Yeah. The audience can't cheer for that. Well, it's, you know, it's it's even tangentially connected to the Snyderverse, so it has to be the darker version where he's, like, an abandoned child yeah. that hates everyone all the time. Uh, but that's a good question. I think so. Yeah. Partly. Yeah, I mean, if you were a superhero, you would be Captain Marvel. I'll take it. Not only for just, like, the, the, the plucky optimism, but also because it involves the Greek gods. And the half cape. And the- Big fan of the half cape. <laughs> you, look, you know what? He looks great in that half cape. Yeah. Big fan of the one shoulder. Just toss over the shoulder. It looks so good. (laughs) I mean, okay, I actually have not really read a lot of stuff that has Captain Marvel in it. Um, I mean, I think probably the the biggest thing that I've read with him in it is uh, the novel Kingdom Come, the graphic novel Kingdom Come, which this um, episode in particular uh, heavily uh, references. Um, And then he's also in some of the Injustice comics of our call, which are actually, like, pretty good. But I don't, I haven't read a lot of stuff of his, but he's a character that I've always just really liked. I think he's, he is interesting. He's kind of unique in being this, like, this dream of what happens when a kid becomes a hero. People don't know that he's a kid. Plus, he's he's got a cool power set. He's got a cool look. Yeah. I love the Captain Marvel costume. Me too. I think it's just awesome. The half cape, man. It's all about that half cape. That sweet, sweet half cape. But, like... The bright red look, the big lightning bolts, like, it's just, it's a cool design all the way through. Yeah, and I think compared to Superman, I think Superman gets a lot of flack because he is, you know, he can do, any, he can do anything he wants. Yeah. You know, his, his powers have been slowly chipped away since the 60s. Mm-hmm. Um, but everyone was kind of annoyed because, like, he is the perfect man. Yeah. Where Shazam, you're coming in with, or with Captain Marvel, you're coming in with the, like, you can understand a kid to have this plucky optimism, but no one would expect an adult to be this right. This optimistic about anything. He's like he's a little bit weird. Like even the rest of the league, they're all like, 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This, this is like it, his charm is undeniable, but it's also weird. It's interesting that Batman buys into it. Yeah, because this whole episode is pinned on. I don't want to call it Superman's ego because it's, no, it's not exactly but, that. I mean, but it's, it's not far from it. it. I'd say it's his ego, right? I mean, he's he's jealous. You know, it's like Batman even says, like, don't you think you're a little hard on the Boy Scout? And Superman's response is, I thought I was the Boy Scout. <laughs> I used to be the Boy Scout. <laughs> I'm the Boy Scout. Mm. But, like, I mean, there is an element of that. I mean, Superman has always kind of been this, this paragon that everyone looks up to and this – this image of sort of kind of unflinching heroism and optimism. Um, and, you know, and I think there's something to be said for him probably already feeling like to some degree that idea is compromised by being a part of the league and the full scope of Cadmus hasn't been entirely revealed to them yet. Even to us as an audience, we're getting closer and closer, but you know, like, just a couple of episodes ago, Batman was calling out Superman and being like, oh, now we're gods passing judgment on, like, mortal beings um, when they send Doomsday into the Phantom Zone. And, you know, it's like, at this point now, Superman isn't just an independent hero saving Metropolis. Like, you know, he says we don't get involved in politics, but politics is inescapable when you're a part of this massive organization. You're one of the leaders of it. Like, with that sort of leadership comes extra responsibility. And I bet he as a character has been feeling that he's having a harder time maintaining that idealized image because the role he now has trying to lead, you know, dozens of other heroes around him. So I I think that tension's already existing. Plus Cadmus is actively projecting that idea out into the world. The league is all powerful, that they are irresponsible, that they're dangerous. And then here comes along this hero that, isn't burdened with any of that sense of responsibility and perspective and gets to be like an even more idealized version of Superman. Totally makes sense that his, his ego and his jealousy would start to come into play here. Plus he's probably just background pissed off every single day because Lex Luthor is running for president. Yeah. It's, it, it, it's an interesting comparison because he, the league is now a business. Yeah. Essentially. And, and the way you described it is someone, cause like, you know, I work in a creative field. You work yeah. in a creative field. There is a point where you will get promoted while still working in a creative field where you will not get to be creative anymore. Yeah. And that's basically what Superman is dealing with is he was he was the the number one who now has to who now can't be that role anymore. He has to manage everyone. He's, he's yeah. become a manager. He has to really think through everything he does in a way that he didn't have to before because it affects other people. Mm hmm. No, at this point, it affects the whole league. It affects Bruce Wayne's bank account. Yes, that's the biggest one. I loved the moment at the end when <laughs> Lex Or City's broken. He's like, yeah. the league will pay for it. And he looks over his shoulder and Batman just goes, yeah, sure. Uh, fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I love the dynamic between these two. Do you think Batman is twisting the dagger a little bit more? Because of, like it's the first time we see Superman kind of shaking in his shell. I mean... He's not helping, certainly. I, I I think it's not quite that, I would say. Like, when he has that conversation, like, I think you're a little hard on the Boy Scout. I think that's not him, like, twisting the, the knife, twisting the Batarang, so much as it's him knowing that he's pretty much the only person in the league who can have that kind of conversation with him. Who can, like, kind of call him and be like, hey, like, you were a bit much. Which, again, if Batman right. is telling you that you're being a bit much... Stop and reconsider your choices. <laughs> like, I mean, actually, that that is an interesting thing. I feel like we kind of touched upon it a little bit, but, like, Batman is having to really become the conscience of the League in this season because he's the only one who's really acknowledging that Cadmus is right. Absolutely. And, pe- like, showing, watching this episode alongside watching Task Force X from a couple weeks ago, yeah. we're seeing the League, like kind of not dissolve that's not the right word they're kind of falling apart a little bit yeah they're they're more not morality yeah their morality is 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 being questioned at every possible angle where we see yeah. john uh kind of like you know he wants to mind wipe a guy th- like erase three years of his life yeah he's like you know gl's like you can't do that that's that's not what we do yeah and now superman's here because there's another aspect where it's it's all like the ego is at peak inflation, 
or uh, not at inflate. I, I like uh, it, it's so scared mm -hmm. is when he finds the battery and Captain Marvel comes in like, hey, let's get Captain Adam to come in. Just like look at it really quick. Yeah. Like, we don't have time. You have instant transportation. Yep. Which we've talked about for three weeks now. <laughs> the people just seem to forget all the time. He's got to be the hero. He's got to be the hero. That's the thing. He's like, I have to do it. I have to be the hero. I have to save the day. Me, 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 me. Yeah. He he pulled a Batman. He did. Well, yeah. And I'm going to crash the watchtower. <laughs> I'm just going to crash it. You know, and, and it, I, I think what this season really kind of plays into is the idea that, like, you know, it's it's actually very hard to do the right thing. And part of doing the right thing is having to make hard choices and sometimes those choices can rub against your own sense of morality. And when your whole image is built on being the good guy doing the right thing, any sort of crack in that, which is naturally going to occur that can be exploited is going to be exploited and thrown in your face to make it seem like you're the evil monsters who are making the world the worst place. I'm totally not referring to anything happening in the real world, particularly in our country at all. When I say those things, but there is something of that going on here, right? Of like the league are the good guys who are actually trying to do the right thing. And, you know, Cadmus will take any opportunity they can to make it seem like anything that's slightly morally compromised um, or is a slightly a hard choice between two in ideal options um, is a sign of them being just pure evil. Right. They're giving them the what's the railroad test? It has a name, doesn't it? It probably does. but I don't know what it is. But yeah, it's you know, you can either kill two or pull the lever and kill four or however it's set up and uh, cadmus is being like well why are they on the railroad anyway like yeah, exactly. how could the lead let them get on the rail like how you they put let them, them get there. on the tracks yeah it's like that's not what happened <laughs> you clearly designed this yeah yeah it's you want to murder americans <laughs> i mean it you know, it, I'd put the flag in the way and it would stop the train. <laughs> no, that's what the test would be. You can either uh, have the train run over five people or you can have it run over the American flag. And then you choose to save the five people. Say, How dare you run over the American flag? Yeah. <laughs> Fucking hell. But I mean, that's I mean, that's what makes this this season and these episodes in particular, like so relevant now as it does look at that idea of like what happens when the good guys have to make the, the bad calls. And like. Obviously, that was also part of the political discourse back when these were made in the early 2000s. It's just much more apparent now. Um, but, I mean, there there is something relevant there. And, and obviously, this is still a, a cartoon and it's hyperbolic. So they have to also at the same time show that the League is making questionable decisions, like sending Doomsday off and having this massive space laser. And they have to show us that to some degree, Cadmus is kind of right even if they're going about it the entirely wrong way. And it's like, I think, I think th this episode in particular really tips it into the space of like super villainy, right? Like you can kind of get where they're coming from early on, right? You, you, you understand that their mission makes sense and they definitely already made questionable choice at this point like you know cloning supergirl and making galatea and like not i mean kind of like torturing her until to some degree until she's you know this this finding automaton the same way they sort of did with doomsday and them breaking into the watchtower and like sacrificing with their team members trying to steal something but this is where it's like a full-on like machiavellian scheme right where they're literally setting up superman to have like a pr nightmare right yeah the the 21st century problem yeah can we cancel superman uh, yeah i mean yes exactly that's essentially what they're trying to do here yeah and it's i mean it's look it's effective it's very effective it's really effective i at feel the like end it'd of the be day. even easier nowadays oh it would be, it'd be so, so easy <laughs> so so fucking easy um but i mean along the way there are things that are like raising the stakes right so not only does marvel accidentally endorse lex but then he goes and has a, a meeting with uh, the founders at their table and superman has this fantastic speech where he says you know uh we're the justly we don't play favorites we don't sell deodorant on television to which flash kind of like looks off to the side in embarrassment uh we don't get involved in politics and we certainly don't endorse super villains for the presidency um like he is fucking fuming at all of this understandably um 
But then the other thing that happens is that Emil Hamilton calls and says that someone broke into Star Labs and stole four pounds of weapons grade kryptonite. And when Batman investigates, he sees that it was Luther Tech that broke in. But as he points out, anyone could have gotten a hold of it and it could have been deliberately used to try and incriminate Lex. This is not proof that he was actually involved. Right. Lex would be smarter than to leave his own trace behind. Exactly. But then, you know, once Superman shows up at lex or city and lex says that oh the this thing is powered by kryptonite it it does sort of imply that the theft led to this i mean it's never explicitly stated and obviously the theft was just faked right Right. yeah because i forgot that they don't know Emilia hamilton is part of cadmus yet right yeah they they because they don't they don't know yet that he created galatea right we know that but they don't yeah, he, so I think Batman only... Question does, probably. Question probably does, yeah. So I think at this point, what, and I'm trying to remember, I think Batman knows that Waller's involved. This basically confirms that Lex was involved, too, because at the very end he says, like, you know, we fell into their trap. Um, they set you up. So we know it's... He knows it's Waller. He knows it's Lex. Um, he probably can, suspects it's Hardcastle. Oh, I was going to say they probably can assume Eiling. Oh, Eiling, not Hardcastle. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, yes. Um, but yeah, I don't think they know Hamilton yet as a traitor. Right, yeah, because he's so close to Superman. Yeah, and has been for so long. Yeah. So, I mean, it, 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 they're it, they're in a real, real shit position. But ultimately, this just leads to this this fight between Superman and Captain Marvel. And it's a pretty brutal fight. They destroy a city. They destroy a full city. I mean, at one point, Superman pulls a vault out of a bank and just starts smashing Marvel in the face with it. To the point where once Superman then like breaks through the ground and gets down to the, the subterranean tunnels where the fusion device is, is contained. Um, when Captain Marvel shows up down there, his face is now all covered in bruises. And like it's it's pretty intense. And I, I mean, it, it just builds an intensity to the point where Marvel grabs Superman and holds on to him and shouts Shazam to hit him with the match lightning because he knows that Superman is vulnerable to magic. And that moment in particular is pulled from Kingdom Come. Right. Now, I don't know if it had been used before that, but that was the version that I knew of. Well, Kingdom Come was 2003-ish? Uh, yeah, I think some, something around there, like early early 2000s. So These have been very recent. Very recent, yeah. And you've read Kingdom Come, right? I have. Th- that is, I think, one of the greatest superhero stories ever written. Yes, you made me read it. I, did I make you read it? Yes. Aw, aren't you glad I did? Yes. <laughs> I mean, but it is. It is fucking brilliant. It's, it's absolutely incredible, and... Um, like I said, that's one of the few things I've actually read that really contains Captain Marvel. But again, like there, there have been a lot of, I think, famous clashes between those two. I, I only really know of, of Kingdom Come. Um, but it's it's a pretty brutal fight. But Superman does get the best of Captain Marvel by like, spinning him around and then turning him back into a kid, which I guess he didn't know that would happen. He just assumed that the lightning would strike Sazam and it would hurt him. Um, <laughs> it's going to kill him. It's going to kill him, yeah. But like, th- there, I mean, I guess Superman is just so cop in the moment he doesn't think about it. But there isn't even a moment where he goes... You're a fucking child? Right. What? Or even a what? moment where, what? like, where's Batman on the intercom? Just being like, That's a good point. Clark, yeah. calm yeah. the fuck down. Yeah. yeah, John's not on comms. Bruce isn't on there. So I'll, I would understand if, like, someone tried and Superman just, like, threw the, cro- threw the comm out of his ear. You know, yeah. that very trope. Pints. Yeah, moment. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, like, no one even tried to calm him. Like, no. that's, that's Batman's role. Yeah. Is he is there to bring down Superman's e- Clark's ego. Yeah. Even calling him Clark at the very end. Yeah. And that's why he's not number one in the coding That's why system. he's not. Yeah, that's why he's down at number six. <laughs> six I think we established yeah. it. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, you know, after Superman laser blasts this reactor until it melts and is deactivated, and then the atom shows up, and it's like, yep. Looks like it's exactly what Lex said it was. Um, and then we go up to the, the watchtower and Captain Marvel comes in. And he says, I called this meeting because, you know, I want to be a part of this because you guys are heroes. You don't act like heroes anymore. And I'm withdrawing from the league. And you can tell it all affects them. But then that's when Batman says, like, they set you up. And it's like, what, they? And then it's, you know, the final beat is Lex Luthor and Amanda Waller drinking champagne and being like, it's all going according to plan. Wahahaha. Yes. Wahaha. Great mustache twirling. Exactly. Very Boris and Natasha. Yes. But it's so effective. Yeah. All the way through, this is super, super effective. And just like advancing the Cadmus story, showing the heroes in a way we've never seen them before. 
it's really effective at actually getting two heroes to fight and you believing that they would in that moment and not it feeling contrived in any sort of way. Um, it's an episode where the villains win. Yeah. At the end of the day. Which we will get a couple more of. Yeah. Like, it, th- things are really, really ramping up with Cadmus. I mean, it makes sense. You know, I mean, th- this is now, what, episode seven, right? One, two, three, four, four, six. Yeah. So, like, we're, and we only have a handful left in the Cadmus arc, so it's, it's really ramping up. But I, I, I think this is fantastic. I think this is probably one of the best episodes of the season. I'd agree. I think this and Task Force X, I think, are my top two right now. Yeah. Just because they're, they're so different. They're so different. But, you know, it's interesting because they, they are kind of one-off episodes in some ways, right? Like, I think this is the only appearance of Captain Marvel. Yeah, I believe it is. Because after this, they have the, the like, the same thing with, with Batman. Like, they can't use his gallery. Yeah, I forget. I meant to look this up, but I ran out of time. Um, this is kind of a self-contained thing. Captain Marvel just shows up for this one episode. Um it's just kind of about this fight and that's it. And same way task force S like most of the characters disappear after that. It's just kind of this one-off random thing, but it, because it's also building towards a larger narrative, it doesn't feel like a throwaway thing. It's like really crucial to storytelling while being unlike any other story we've seen them do so far. Yeah. And it's, it's incredible. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I have to ask you, Cameron, did you look up the history of Captain Marvel? I did not. <gasps> unfortunately. Well, you cause I feel like we kind of bastard. know it. <laughs> I've only I like doing it for the obscure characters. We didn't really have I, we had elongated man. We had metamorpho, but I like doing it. Yeah, for the 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 ba- the background boys that don't that don't don't get the spotlight. How dare you, Cameron? You 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 have failed me for the last time. Once I remember where I put that goddamn remote, I'm gonna blow off your head. You left in Hawaii. <laughs> Damn it! And I'll be honest, I also spilled a pina colada on it, so it probably doesn't work anymore. That's that shock that yeah. I felt. <laughs> I was literally like, uh, hope this didn't set it off. I'll find out. <laughs> so we, we've we made jokes before about society paralleling Lex Luthor mm-hmm. very strongly with Trump and uh, Bezos. Yeah. But in this episode specifically, I think I've brought it up on the podcast a few weeks ago. There is a billionaire right now trying to build his own futuristic city called Telosa. Do you know, have you not heard about this? Oh, oh this is fucking Musk's thing. Not Musk. Who is this? Who's uh, this now? It's some like Walmart guy. He's not one of the Waltons, but he was a high up oh, okay. ranking person in the Walmart company, but he's trying to build like the next city, the next big American city somewhere in the desert. Jesus Christ. Uh, called Telosa. And I understand the parallel to Musk. Cause it sounds like Tesla. Yeah. That's why I thought it was Musk. Um, uh, but yeah, it, it's supposed to be like exactly kind of as, as Lex pitched Lexor City. Like it, it's the new place for people to get a second chance, I think, is is the wording they use on the website for Telosa, which is so funny. <sighs> they Re- were so unoriginal. <laughs> we're following the storylines of supervillains now. Reality is stranger than fiction. It is. So it's, it's basically it's all just like an arms race to see who's actually become the world's first genuine supervillain. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to think. Who would I put money on to be become the world's first real Bond villain? Probably Musk. I think he's actually genuinely crazy. I yeah, I think yeah. that's the thing. Is, yeah. is Musk would I think Musk would do it for a bit and then he would just take it too far. Yeah, I think Musk is actually more unhinged than Bezos, which is saying something. But mm-hmm. what what a world we live in. I know. Uh I don't know. Any other any other thoughts on, on Clash here? Uh, I think we covered all of it. I'm trying to think of any of the like fun little uh, pieces of casting here. Obviously, we we mentioned up top that Jerry O'Connell voices Captain Marvel, who uh, I think he they brought him back around again um, to voice the Superman. There's an uh, oh the um, DC short Superman slash Shazam Return of the Black Adam. It was the return of both George Newbern and Jerry O'Connell reprising their roles. Um, oh, there, there's some like fun little little moments here. I mentioned the themes. Uh, Billy Batson attends C.C. Bender School, which is named after writer C.C. Beck and his collaborator Otto Bender, who worked at DC Comics and were very influential in working on Shazam, maybe creating him. I forget which one. Um, oh, the classroom. That's right. <laughs> we, we both that made a beautiful no- George Bush portrait. Yeah, we made, both made note of this, that the, uh, the the classroom that we made reference to in Kid Stuff, when the teacher disappears and all the kids are left, the classroom with the massive George Bush portrait in the background is used once again here. I wonder... 
if we go back and rewatch that, would we see Billy? Do you think it's the same class, like the exact same classroom? Would we see Billy sitting in the front row? Um, I don't know. I don't remember any. I don't remember a piece of trivia about that that mentioned his appearance there. But I wouldn't be surprised if maybe it was. That'd be that'd be pretty that'd be cool. Pretty cool if it's like a little flash forward sort of thing. Um, and then Lex appears on a show called The O'Bannon Agenda, yeah, which is obviously yeah. a riff on the O'Reilly Factor. Yeah, I know. 2005 man like that it's just uh, it's, it's, it's only gotten worse um oh and one other fun uh little thing is obviously we get the return of dan delaney as lois lane which is always fantastic um and mercy graves is back too last we saw her she was running LexCorp and was like not putting up with lex's bullshit but clearly she's back to just like being his right hand again uh, but i was not lo- robotic not robotic. Right. right. Actually, I have to remember. This is not the robotic uh, Not mercy. the robotic mercy. This is the normal one. Uh, and then um, another fun little thing, and I'm probably going to mispronounce this actor's name, but uh, voice actor uh, Shane Habucha voices Billy Batson, the younger version, also voiced the young Superman in kid stuff. Oh, Just kind of a fun, whether it was intentional or not. It's a great parallel. It's a fun little parallel, yeah, of being like they're, you know, they do kind of come from similar backgrounds there to some degree. So, but no, I, I love this episode. I think it's a, a fantastic. And as much as I would love to see more Captain Marvel in the DCAU, they certainly didn't waste him. He kind of gets like pretty much the best, like one and done episode of almost anybody. Yeah. <laughs> so. And his, his mini arc in young justice is also incredible. Oh, that's true. Yeah. He is really, really good in young justice. Yeah. Mm. And you know, and to be fair, the Shazam movie is actually pretty solid of, of the DC movies. Yes. It's a low bar. It's a very low it's bar. A very low bar, but his is pretty good. There's I mean, some pretty good jokes in there. There's some good jokes in there. Zachary Levi is great, as is. is as is the best friend. Um, and the whole family is all pretty fun. I mean, you know, I love Mark Strong, but his Dr. Savannah was not the most compelling villain, and the, the seven deadly sins are just the most generic-looking, pointless lumps of ever. I honestly forgot that that was a thing. It was absolutely a thing. But hey, you know what? High hopes for the next one. Yeah. I The the scene where they're fighting in the sky, and, he, and Mark Strong starts monologuing, and Zach Levi's like, I can't hear you. <laughs> yeah, I can't, yeah. That will always make me <laughs> chuckle. That is such a good, like, riff on superhero movies. That That is. That is a good riff. And yeah, Zachary Levi is so charming in that. And again, they did a really good job with his costume design. It's a good-looking costume. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a good bubble butt. It's a good bubble butt. Uh, all right. Shall we move on to our next episode, Hunter's Moon? Let's do it. Hunter's Moon. All right. So, uh... Things are still a little awkward between Vixen and Jon Stewart since Shayera's return to the League. So when Shayera is sent into a deep space mission to investigate a ship under distress from unrefined nth metal contamination, uh, Vixen joins her and a Thanagarian prejudiced vigilante on the mission. They quickly discover there's a trap set by former Thanagarian Lieutenant Perrin Duel to get revenge on Shayera for portraying her people and causing the Thanagarians to lose the war with the Gordanians. How'd you feel about this episode, Cameron? I wasn't for me. I understand yeah. it's, it's more of like a character piece yeah. than a story piece. But I don't want to jump the gun too early in my game. But I'm going to pitch it now. I think Martian Manhunter did a horrible job picking this team. <laughs> Especially for what the mission was before they knew it was the Thanagarians. Yeah. This was a search and rescue mission. Yes. Why the fuck is Vigilante there? Is he going to cut some rope that they're tied up with? Yeah, it might have it might have been best to send someone maybe with some some super strength, possibly send Captain Adam if it is in fact radioactive, he could absorb whatever's going on. Yeah, we know it's something with nth metal, so like understand you got to send Sha- you got to send Shaira. Yeah. Um and anyway, Honestly, like, this would have been a very good mission to send GL because it's a rescue mission and he can kind of come up with anything on the spot. And I understand why John says no, like, I don't want any sort of issues of chain command considering you're both leaguers, which let's take a slight tangent there. It's very interesting. So Shair has been welcomed back into the league um, and has been immediately elevated up to her original status as a founder and command lead, like, which is both, like, surprising and reasonable. At the same time, like, it would be kind of weird if she was the only founding member who did not have that level of status. But at the same time, she did betray the entire planet and most people on the planet hate her. 
you know, and and even in the last episode, Lex uses Shaira as an example of being like, here's someone who can be redeemed. The league did it themselves. Like most people think that Shaira is a threat and letting her back onto the team was a bad idea. I think it's a great idea though, but Hey, let me remind you, they did that thing. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting that she's like she's back at the founder's table and John even says, like, you have command level. Like, I don't want any sort of question of authority happening here. Right. And I was I was thinking back, I guess all the other missions that had two founders was I guess it was just the last one with um Hawk Girl and Wonder Woman. But that was It's kind of a personal thing. It, yeah. Yeah. And it, they they actively went around getting John's kind of approval for the mission yeah he didn't send them on that mission they just kind of went of their own accord Mm -hmm. but yeah i guess i guess it's a good point i I suppose up to up to now except for any of like the omega level threats um you know like the like the dark heart and stuff like that or amazo Mm -hmm. yeah it's only been one founding member on the team makes sense yeah even on even on the ground uh when they were fighting parasite it was batman and other i don't want to say sub leaguers but non-command level leaguers down there Yes, but still, Vigilante maybe is one of the worst options you could have picked. Maybe not the best How do his guns choice. work in space? They're lasers. Work in space. They're lasers. I keep forgetting they're lasers. Because he, he even opens up the, the six-year chamber, and we see that it's, it's like six like red sections there. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of weird. Like, it's a, it's a laser revolver, which you're like, what? Sure. Why? Like, why, why does the... the I mean, other th- other than it, I mean, I guess it, the answer is it's all just for show. Like, other than like literally for show, why would you actually have it be like a revolver chamber that could open like a traditional pistol because it's just laser blasts? Mm-hmm. It's like you're maybe like changing out cartridges on them at some point. I don't know. It's his, it's his fidget thing. It's what keeps him calm, keeps him zen. Yeah. Everyone has a little fidget toy. I mean, look, it, he. I will give him credit. He really, really leans into his own theming on this. Even like with the like the gold darn it. Yes. The aw shucksness of it all. And we must acknowledge, right at the top, brilliant casting choice. Who? Cameron. Who? Cameron. Who? Who else would you cast as a Western-style spacefaring hero than TV's own Nathan Fillion? Oh, I wasn't going that direction, but I do I do love that. What direction were you going? Um what's his face in the Big Lebowski and also in um Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga Elliot Sam Elliot? Sam Elliot. Okay. I can give past TS Elliot. Okay, I mean <laughs> I know it's very wrong, very far. <laughs> I just watched Midnight in Paris, okay? Okay, fair. Did, didn't did he write the Once and Future King? Was that T. S. Eliot? I don't know. No, no, that was. Uh, I don't know. Doesn't matter. Hemingway. Um, it's it's not it's Hemingway. White. I don't know. I'll have to look it up. Um, okay, you're not wrong, <laughs> but like, I. Here's the thing. Uh, Vigilante does definitely lean into like that, like very Western style hero, but not that Western. But also, like, he doesn't have the the gravelly voice of a man who smoked a packet of marbles a day for for several decades per meal per meal yeah not per day per meal have you you ever seen thank you for smoking i have it's incredible it's a great film it's a really great film but i mean perfectly cast sam elliott as like a former marlboro style spokesperson who i i i don't remember if he actually did that or not but i mean he's he's the ideal choice he must have we want you we we watched roadhouse together right yes okay yeah what the throat pull? Right uh, at the house? Yeah, okay. it's, it's a Patrick Swayze where he's yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. cooler when he like works at a bar to like cool things down and like he's, it's like more than a bouncer. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's an actual real thing or not, but yeah, Sam Elliott's in that, and he the man has looked the same, which is to say, amazing. Yeah, for decades. Yeah, you think that mustache would like stretch his skin out a little bit? Oh, it hasn't. No, 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 no. It's the source of his power. Yeah. In fact, okay, so. Yes, you're, you're right. That is like an iconic Western style gravelly voice, but not this one. No, yes, they, they, but yeah, Nathan Fillion Nathan, is, is a Nathan great Fillion, pick. Which I is apologize also, for not having that offhand. Right, which is also fun because he's on a mission with Vixen played by Gina Torres. So it's like a little mini Firefly re- reunion as they're traveling through space. Intentional That's or sweet. not, 
it's pretty fun. But you're right, like, not only is Vigilante probably not the best person to go on a search and rescue mission, but also probably not the best person to put under command of Shaira, considering that he is, like, very, very prejudiced against the Anagarians because he had to fight them when they invaded. Now, this is the first time we've kind of acknowledged that the other heroes existed at the time of the Thanagarian invasion, and though they weren't part of the overall story, they were dealing with it on the ground. Because he even talks about how, like, he fought them, was captured, and was, like, tortured a little bit by them, and Vixen says, yeah, I fought them too. We all did. Um, but, yeah, he's kind of a prick. Yeah. Through pretty much all of this. I, I do think that is, like I said, if we're focusing on the character piece and not the story piece, it does make sense for him to be there, because you need to see that it's not just Vixen that doesn't like Shaira because of, because of GL. Yeah. A lot of people don't like her because the Thanagarians suck. Yeah, for and for good reason. And and I I do agree with you. I think, I think this episode had a lot of work to do. And I think that they kind of started with the the, the initial points of okay, can we kind of wrap up some of the remaining threads post Star Crossed? One just in terms of like what happened to um, Hrotalic. Sorry, Hrotalic. What happened to Thanagarians? Um, you know, what? how was the rest of the League dealing with Shayer being back? And obviously the ongoing narrative about this this love triangle between uh, Vixen, Shayer, and John. Like, I think that's their starting point. Like, okay, let's kind of construct a story around this. And it, it doesn't totally work. But I will say, like, the character stuff is pretty solid. Like, there's not even a lot of plot beats necessarily. It's just kind of a lot of, like, a lot of conversations around them all trusting each other. Like the whole episode is basically around like trust. Can we trust Shaira? Um, you know, did she betray us? Is Vixen going to betray her, which she seemingly does at one point like it. And yeah. then vigilante just injured on the ground. Like, Hey, we're going to leave you for a couple days. Yeah, just don't die. <laughs> just chill here. You know, you'll be fine. But it, it, it does have an interesting opening because it starts with Vixen basically trying to get John's attention. He's just like very distracted and not really, really paying attention to her. And she's like, all right, like we're going tonight. It's a date night. Let's get Chinese. We're going to Beijing. We're not just going to a little place next to your apartment. He's like, well, I'm not off till like 0600. She's like, that's fine. I love breakfast in China. We're going to make it happen. She tries to like kiss him. He's like, Mari, please, this is not the right place. And it's like, it's just all very awkward. It's basically John Stewart just continuing to be a real shit boyfriend. Yeah, and then you see Green Arrow and Hawk, uh, not, not Hawk, and Black Canary on the other side just fully making out on the table. Exactly, like, <laughs> we're good. <laughs> we don't yeah. have your drama. <laughs> yeah, GL, this isn't the place. Yeah. It's like, what? It's what? It's not. Oh, okay. When, oh, sorry, we'll go to the showers. <laughs> I, I think we got to point out, if, if Huntress and the Question have a healthier relationship than you do, you got issues. Yes. Because <laughs> they definitely don't have things working out very well for them. Um, I mean, look, I... Jon Stewart. Total beefcake. Very, very hot. Totally into it. Even I'm like, mm, I'd pass. You're a shit boyfriend. Mm-hmm. Real shit boyfriend. Well, because we brought up a few weeks ago when it was the time travel episode about paradoxical uh, ethics. Oh, right. Oh, because, okay. Because you she know brings what? up, like, it's been a few weeks since, like, you've even, like, talked to me. You know what? You raise a very good point. I had forgotten about that. But at this moment, John remembers that in a future, at least, he and Shayra have a kid. Yeah. And that would, that, how, like, that would have a huge impact on your relationship. Okay, fine. He's not being a shit boyfriend. Well, he is being a shit boyfriend because he's being emotionally unavailable because he's deeply, deeply confused. Right. He's not bringing up the conversation. But that's a hard conversation to bring up. I mean, hey, I no one remembers this except for me and Batman, my bro, the guy who will stand up for me no matter what, uh, where we got sucked into the future and no one else remembers. And we saw a version where everyone was dead mm -hmm. and Chair and I had a kid. Okay, Th this actually raises, raises an interesting question. Do you think that John and Bruce briefed anyone else in the league on that mission after it happened? Because I imagine that there must be some sort of like mission debrief system set up in place that can keep records on all these things and keep track of who does what and what happens. It, maybe even just purely for legal purposes, we're being honest. But do you think after that one, where everything basically just kind of resets to zero with the exception of their knowledge of the mission itself. 
Do you think they actually brief the other founders on what happened? I think they briefly bring it up to to Manhunter, to mm -hmm. John, and they see, like, hey, do you remember any of this? He says no. He's like, okay. And they don't ever bring it up again. You think they kept it themselves? Mm -hmm. I think they probably did, too. Because it's so hard to explain. It, and you raise a very good point, because you think about, like, okay, in this universe, crazy shit happens all of the time. So you feel like you could just, he could go to Mari and be like, hey, let's sit down and have a conversation. And even though crazy shit happens all the time, that is so absurd. And because no one else is there to prove it other than Batman, and you're like, one, will he back you up? And two, like, he's not going to elaborate. If John's just like, hey, Batman, remember this happening? Batman would be like, yeah. Yeah. And then walk away. So it's like, he's not... <laughs> He's not going to help you out a lot in this context. So I can totally see, even if you try to explain it to her, she'd be like, what the fuck are you saying? Like, if you want to break up, just break up with me. Don't make up some crazy story about a potential future kid with your ex. Yes. Yeah. Because that I. OK, so thinking more on that, going deeper than we need to. Of course. Um, Marsh Manhunter can read minds. Yes. And can extract memories. True. To an extent. So he could True. kind of show it. But would it. Because they experienced it, so he would have it. But how... What is the difference between, ex, like, extracting a memory from, like, a real memory or extracting a memory from, like, a dream? I don't know. That's a good question. It's like, oh, so you're dreaming about having a kid with Shaira. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I guess he really couldn't explain this all to her. And he, that would be, like, a really emotionally challenging thing of, like, what do I do with this yeah how do i make this happen so okay you know what fine i was not thinking through all the things that are going on in john's head right now doesn't stop him from being a little bit shitty yeah and his support system is batman or the, flash. Or, the flash or the flash <laughs> which is even worse <laughs> it's not like you can go to superman for relationship advice considering that superman is like as we see later on in justice league like kind of dating lois but lois doesn't know that he's clark Right. So he's not really the best person to go to for advice, is he? No. So, I mean, could he, I guess he could go to Wonder Woman for, for advice on this. She's wise. Yeah. She's only hung up on a guy from the 1940s. Um, less so in this version. That's true. To be fair. But yeah, I guess he does. Um, she does go to the retirement home at the end of yeah, that episode. Yeah, she's a sweetheart. She yeah. wants to go visit him. So yeah, I guess he doesn't really have the best like group of people to go look to for advice. Definitely not going to go ask elongated man. It's Green Arrow and Black Canary. Honestly, not the worst. Yeah. I mean, I love the version of Black Canary where she's like the therapist in Young Justice. Yeah, that version is fantastic. Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, outside of the cat and the canary, once that episode's passed, like Green Arrow and Black Canary probably do have the healthiest relationship in the entire league. Yeah. So. Yeah. Because there's no like married heroes. Not that we know of. No. And so yeah, it's not, like. Not in this iteration. Yeah. It's like they're a couple. Green Lantern and Vixen are a couple, but there's, like, the X thing with Shaira. Bruce mm -hmm. and Diana are this weird, like, isn't going to happen, is it not sort of thing. The, yeah, the Ross and Rachel. Ross and Rachel, Tower. the Sam and Diane. So, uh, yeah, so he doesn't have a lot of good people to go to for advice, does he? But even then, like, when um, Vixen volunteers to go on the mission and Jean agrees that GL's like, hey, like, why would you send my girlfriend and my ex on the same mission? And <laughs> Jean's point is, I don't take your love life into consideration when making command decisions. <laughs> it's just such a such a necessary and savage burn on green lantern but like yeah i mean I, the rest of the episode i feel like there's not that much to get into in terms of the meat of it like they get out there we as we established like vigilante is prejudiced against shaira there's this trust issue between shaira and vixen around john like they both recognize that they have feelings for him still um we do learn the fate of hro talic who, I guess, after they left Earth, they showed back up at the Thanagarian planet, and the Gardanians had busted through, like, the defenses, and basically had, like, defeated everyone and had taken over. And so Pro went on, like, it's essentially a suicide mission, taking as many ships as he can, and eventually crashing his ship into the Gordanian flagship to kill as many of them as he could while letting um, Perrin duel and his other lieutenants escape. Um, but, yeah, he's dead. The Thanagarians are not quite wiped out, but basically, like, scattered to the winds now that their home planet's been destroyed. It's a pretty devastating thing for Cher to learn, especially considering that she caused that, even if it was the right choice in terms of saving Earth. Who 
what was the name of Chris Hemsworth's character in Star Trek? George Kirk. George Kirk. Father of James Tiberius. Tiberius. Kirk. Kirk. Yes. Okay. Yeah, because yes. I was getting a lot of parallels between when when yeah. George makes the sacrifice play. Exactly. Which oh my god, bro. The, the opening of that movie. It's so good. It's I'm so gonna go good. rewatch that. I, I I'm I'm I am but a, a a slight gust of winds push away from going and rewatch that movie all the time. <laughs> I fucking love it so much. And that opening is spectacular and so emotional and the ah, Giacchino. Tiberius? No. <laughs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> no, what is it? No, what's the it's like we should name it after your dad. Tiberius, yeah, yeah. Is, oh, is that, is that Yeah, so okay. George's father is named Tiberius. Mm-hmm. So it said they named him after... Um, oh, her dad. Her dad. James. Yes. It's a James Tiberius Kirk. Mm-hmm. It's great. I fucking love, love that movie so much. We just go so, watch it now? We should just go just watch it now. Just get the podcast and go watch it? Um, so we're back. So we're back. Yeah, <laughs> we, we've got to watch it. Uh, it's amazing. Um, but yeah, so it's all it's all a trap, basically, to try and, and capture and hold Sheer accountable for her actions. We learn the fate of, of Ro and... We uh, we see that after Jean tried to do the uh, um, uh, mind mel with Krager, that he's all left kind of fucked up in this big robotic suit. Um, and from there on, it's just kind of like a back and forth thing of like they're trying to escape the Thanagarians. Vixen gets captured. She seemingly betrays Shaira. She says, you know, we want the same man, so I'm going to like turn her over to you, but first take me to your ship. Then she can use that to try and call for help. It's all just kind of this constant back and forth thing, but like, well, she Shire wants to keep making the sacrifice play. She yeah. wants to give herself up. Yeah, well, because she, she think that's that's her pen or her penance. Yeah, she feels guilty. Like, understandably, she does feel guilty for her choice. Like, she did what she thought was the right call at the time, but it had a price. Yeah, and a price that other people had to pay, not just her. Right, and now, understandably, vigilante and vixen don't trust her to make the play. Like, yeah, you're just gonna go back to them. Like, you've had this option before, and you chose them. Yeah. You know, you're 50 50 right now with choosing us and them. Mm-hmm. It's like, how do we know which way you're going to flip this time? Right. You know, and yeah, and and there's a lot of this question of like where where loyalties lie in general, right? The whole episode's kind of about like where do your loyalties lie? Like, you know, can these leaguers who were, you know, uh, left damaged either physically or mentally from the Thanagari invasion be loyal to someone who they saw as a traitor at one point, you know, is John still loyal to Vixen? Does he still maintain loyalties to Shira? She's still loyal to the Thanagarians to some degree. And, you know, when Shira learns that Hro is dead, Vixen even asks, like, you still have feelings for him. She says, yeah, for a lot of people I've let down. I mean, she's laying it out there on the table, basically, that what's going on here. And I, the, most of the episode kind of plays out just a little bit, a little bit generic. It's not super interesting. But I will say that the the kind of button there on the end I do enjoy, which is they get off the ship and John runs up and he's like, oh, my God, like, you know, are you OK? And we're not even quite sure who he's referring to because he's literally standing between Vix and Shaira and they just walk past him. And he's like, wait, wait, Mari, Shaira, where are you going? And, you know, Vixen asks, like, should we do this now? No time like the present. So we, they're going to hash it out. And I do like that it cuts them just kind of like laughing and making fun of John and like finding that common out of like, yeah, he's kind of ridiculous, like. He watches Old Yeller and, and folds his socks. And I do love Shara's comment of like, oh, I have seen his underwear Oh, drawer. that was a great <laughs> just little tss, I've, bring in there. I have seen it. Oh, don't worry. I've seen it, babe. I've seen it. I, I've, I've seen his interdimensional closet he keeps inside the ring construct. Oh, it's not the only thing he keeps in there. <laughs> have you seen his other interdimensional closet? That's where the kinky stuff is held. Oh, that's <laughs> like kinky, his cowboy outfit. The kinky closet. Yeah, <laughs> this is Western garb. Yeah, but I mean, I, I like that they basically, you know, as Vixen puts it, it's like, you know, it doesn't, like, if it's, a, if it's a book or if it's a movie, I'm not, you know, even if it's not the best, I have to see it through to the end, you know, and the the final line there is basically like unguard sort of thing. Like, okay, like they, they kind of acknowledge that they're both going to keep pursuing him. And it, it, like, there's a part of me that doesn't like that their whole dynamic is like built around them fighting over a guy. But I also do kind of like the way they establish a respect for each other and kind of see each other as, as equals. And and I suppose, yes, competitors for John, but also like, I don't know. There's something about that beat. I did really like the, the, the dynamic they established there between the two of them. Yeah, because it doesn't feel because that's not their only characteristic. I suppose. Yeah, that's true. And it's it, it's a small part of their character. Yeah, 
Because, yeah, I mean, we've also seen that they can work together as heroes. And they're both very competent and effective heroes. And there's other things at play there, too. Um, and I think maybe it's part of it is just that, like, th- for being part of a love triangle, I feel like those two characters are also given a little bit more to do than just that. Or even if one of their biggest story arcs is being part of a love triangle, they never feel like damsels in distress right. or like they're minimized or they're they're only just that like they are both total badasses and you're like honestly like john should be so lucky to be with either of them right so s- step it up john maybe stop being such a shitty boyfriend all the time <laughs> So instead of vigilante, <laughs> you've been waiting so patiently to get to this. I, I, okay. I'm trying to think okay. of like anyone else they could have picked better. I I don't know why I went to Adam Smasher first, but I feel like he'd be pretty good on search and rescue. He's a big guy. He's a big guy. He can lift things. He can, he can get larger. Yeah. Cause I also just want a moment. I want someone who will like get in between the relationship drama where like they kind of they're standing in the background and they hear Chayera and Vixen kind of, kind of bantering to each other about John mm-hmm. and someone being like, "Well, like, have you ever thought about?" And both of them just turning like, "Shut up!" <laughs> like kind of like a flash moment. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm looking at the list here. Who who else could they jump in and be pretty effective here? Um, ah, Booster Golds. Booster Gold would be pretty good. Maybe he's got he's got good powers. Maybe a little bit of a, a an ego. Yeah, I don't think John um, let him go off planet. Yeah, I mean, I think Doctor Fate is is very varied in his powers, but he's probably doing other shit. Yeah, he wouldn't go. Um, Metamorpho could be useful there, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, you're on another planet. You you know he he could learn a new element. Yeah, to turn uh, into steel. Steel would be great. Steel would be yeah. good. Throw in there, uh, Supergirl. Always, yeah, be pretty solid. Um, maybe Zatanna. I was thinking Zatanna. Yeah, because I would, I would like the three. Like, I feel like she'd be a good intermediary between them. Yeah, as like someone who kind of not really, but sometimes maybe dated Batman. Yeah, so as someone who like dated Bruce and came away from it being like it wasn't worth it. Right. Yeah, she has she have good insight. I'm being like, mm-hmm. hey, have you guys thought about just not dating him? Yeah, have you thought about uh, just letting it go? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, letting him be kind of a shit boy. But also, <laughs> can we just establish real quickly that Jon Stewart has a history of really questionable dating decisions. Like, he only dates, like, colleagues. Because he dated um, Kat Matui, right? Yep. Kat Matui's name mm-hmm. from the Green Lantern Corps. Then he dated Shaira, and now he's dating Vixen again. Yes. It's almost like he's setting himself up for failure. He's, he's very work incestual. Yes, which is weird considering he was a Marine. Obviously, like, you know, he's straight, so he wasn't, like, dating other Marines there. But you would think that would kind of set up an idea of, like, conflict of interest. Might we don't have of a lot issue. of free time, Chris. <laughs> you know, you you should understand this. We both live and work in L.A. There's not a lot of free time outside of work. Yes. You know, you got your you, playing field is much smaller when you're stuck in it's stuck in the same office building for 18 hours a day. Yes. It must be very hard for a man who can travel across the galaxy at a moment's notice to meet new people. Yes. Yes. So, so hard for him. Yeah. But I mean, at the same time, we've seen how he dresses when he's not in a Green Lantern uniform. That doesn't help him very much. Right. A cowboy. A cowboy. <laughs> or like some random like like record producer look. Yep. When he's at the fashion show. Not the best decisions on uh, on John Stewart's part there. Um, yeah. Any and other? also like. Superman dates Lois, his colleague. Yeah, that's Batman true. And lies with, to her about it. Yeah, Batman is with Wonder Woman and sometimes or Zatanna. That's colleagues. true. Yeah. But they were... They, you know, or they Phantasm, were, who's a murderer. Yep. Or Catwoman, who's a villain. <laughs> okay, none of them have good dating decisions. Right. Oh, okay, very... Bruce has the worst one of all, dating Barbara. Yeah. His best friend's daughter slash his adopted son's ex-girlfriend. Right lots of level of fucked up there well because now i'm trying to think of like who are heroes that dated normal people and we infamously have uh cow ranner and the fridge yes uh and then well um uh, flash and iris iris west that's true yeah but this isn't uh barry allen this is wally west so mm-hmm. he's definitely not dating his cousin they're yes. related they're related to some degree i can't remember what um from identity crisis 
you have the, the identity crisis has the, has the great one because that goes through all of the normal wives yeah they're all being targeted and so elongated man's wife is the first one who i think is murdered yeah that's right mm. it's just there's no there's no good there's no there's no 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 there's any, anyone any um oh you know what hang on i do have an answer to this from this universe okay but it is i would say a spoiler for a later episode oh then hold off please so we'll hold off on it but we'll circle mm-hmm. back to this when we get to that um but i well, I, I and uh question aren't technically colleagues anymore that's true yep she quit or that's was fired <laughs> and you know again you know what? sometimes it works again green arrow and black canary yeah post cat and the canary best relationship in the justice league they're doing great they're doing great they're doing very so happy well. for them so. uh <laughs> <laughs> any other thoughts on hunter's moon or shall we mosey on here let's keep it moving all right uh we actually are have uh, a return to notes from friends this week i finally <gasps> stopped being lazy and uh looked through some messages and ha- have a few lovely ones here um so we we got a message a few weeks back uh from the lovely uh chris cons on instagram who wrote in to say uh, uh hi chris and cameron uh, i'm a new listener of the podcast working through the backlog and already made it up to static and zeta so sorry about that. Wow, yeah, you you trudged through the worst of it. Oh, it's, the, it's the part you can always skip. Um, I'm training for my first marathon, and potentially only marathon. It's really hard. Uh, he and I now follow each other on Instagram. He's continued to train, so Amazing. well done, Chris. Incredible. Um, he ran like 19 miles yesterday. Fuck off, It's ridiculous, man. I know. It's like, my God, man. Uh, and you've been worked out for five hours yesterday. <laughs> exactly. you, that's a bad idea. Yeah, it's a bad idea. Uh, and you've been keeping me company during the many, many hours of training. Uh, the DCU was the most important show for me when I was a kid. Uh, as an extremely depressed, closeted gay kid, superheroes was what helped me find my queerness. And I've been looking my whole life for other gay nerds to talk about these shows with. Uh, sorry, Cameron. I know you're straight, but I still like hearing from you. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, I'm happy lo- to be part of the conversation. <laughs> uh, love the pod. Love you guys. And, uh, you know, uh, hit me up if you guys are ever in uh, Brooklyn. Also, Cameron, if you're looking for a co-host for Jackie Chan Adventures Talk, I'm available. All right. <laughs> I'll hit you up. So, uh, but yeah, no, Chris is awesome. He and I have been like channeling more Instagram. And um, yeah, we, we both share a commonality that Chris O'Donnell as Robin was a sexual awakening moment for, <laughs> for both of us, for a lot of gays our age. Sock actually. Sock, oh, oh, sock foo. Yeah. Oh, sock foo. All the gratuitous uh, butt shots. Um, but yeah, no, Chris is super awesome. Uh, lovely chatting with him a little bit. Um, oh, and we were talking about... Uh, Himbos. He said another himbo of note, uh, Bolin from Legend of Korra, which oh, he yeah. thought he would oh, appreciate. Oh, yeah. Great, great himbo. I want to so, get a good Bolin cosplay one day. Yeah, you should do it. You should mm-hmm. absolutely do it. Um, but no, thanks, Chris, for writing in and, uh, you know, for continuing to chat. And uh, yeah, I'm glad we're able to help be at least, well, one of the two of us can be a fellow gay nerd to talk about this sort of stuff with. Yeah, you're you're kind of like an honorary gay in a lot of ways, Cameron. Well, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. <laughs> Uh, and good luck on your marathon. That that's a huge feat. Yeah, no, yeah, he's he's kicking ass with it. So, uh, and then we also got um, a few messages in from from one of our favorites, the great Ashley Clark, who uh, after our Suicide Squad episode sent in a little fan art that she made. I'm gonna pass my phone across Aww. to you here so you can check it out. Is it my grave? It is in fact your grave. The animator. <laughs> R.I.P. The animator with a little Mickey ears on top of it. Uh, and then she also sent one uh, in for me, and it's a R.I.P. Chris's good puns. Anger in the animator proved to be a grave mistake. It's good, absolutely beautiful. Thank you, Ashley, for sending these in. I will. Uh, I'll post this to our Instagram story uh, this week to share. Um, but uh, thank you for writing in. I know we have other messages. Um, I'll I'll try to get better about getting to those every week. Uh, it's been a little bit busy of late, but. Uh, if you want to find us, it's uh, at Tim Talk Pod on Instagram. If we're being honest, it's probably the best way to do it. Yes. Or Gmail, which is TimTalkPod, gmail.com. But anywho, uh, shall we wrap things up here with some bat plugs? Let's do some plugs. All right. What do you got, Cameron? Uh, as of recording, mm-hmm. it is October 3rd. 3rd? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> what What is time? Yeah. What is time? Uh, and so for this month... I have I've made a 31 day Halloween movie list for me to try to achieve. So you have given up on Inktober entirely. Fully. Oh, I'm not okay. even going to try this year. <laughs> you made it one in last I'm, year? I made it one in last year, three in the year before. Okay. Well, I, I mean, just that, never that, made it a week. That is, you know what? 
that at least that is like a a constant progression of lack of effort. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, okay, you got yourself a a a, a thirty one movie list for the month of October. Presumably all Halloween related. Yes. Okay. Uh, or you know scary related, sure, not sure, scary, sure. but you know family friendly scary. Of course, yes. Uh, and so my goal is, you know, watch one movie a day, but at least one new movie to add to my Halloween kind of catalog okay. a week. Okay. Uh, I have not watched my new one yet, but uh, I have recently rewatched uh, Scooby Doo and the Witch's Ghost. I've never seen that 1999. one. 1999. Uh, it's a great voice cast. Tim Curry's in it. Oh. Uh, none of the normal Scooby gang are voiced by their normal counterparts except for frank welker was this no not even that it's a different scooby voice too oh interesting did this come out after zombie island yes Uh, it was alien invasion zombie island wait i thought zombie island was the first one where it was like the real monsters yes yeah so that was a big deal about it like this time the monsters are real right but alien invasion i think was the first of the 90s and like straight to straight to video. Okay, but they weren't actual aliens. Right, they weren't. Oh, okay, okay, got it. Okay, yeah. Okay. Uh, but yeah, this is also the introduction of the Hex Girls, which is why I watched it. Oh, of course. I love the Hex Girls. Of course you do. Uh, yes, I watched that. And then yesterday I watched uh, Halloween Town 1 and 2, my favorites. <laughs> I mean, I was about to say, how did you find time to watch two movies yesterday? But then I remember that you probably did not move after you finished your five hour workout. Oh, so. I did not. Uh, but some of the ones I want to check out for this month for my new list, I've never watched Practical Magic. Oh, okay. Want to yeah. add that? Uh, the Evil Dead Two, because I've heard it's very funny. Mm-hmm. Uh, Freaky, which is the the movie that came out two years I ago. I really want to watch that. Yeah, yeah. With, uh, Vince Vaughn and um, not Chloe. Catherine Newton. Sure. <laughs> Let me check this up. I'm gonna double check this. I'm gonna be it's, really. It's Freaky Friday with the serial killer. I'd be very happy with myself if I'm right. <clears throat> I've heard good things. I've heard really good things Same. about it. Yeah. Uh, but if anyone needs a Halloween movie to watch, I have 31 plucked out already. Now, so are, are you including any, like, straight-up horror films in there? Uh, Bride of Frankenstein. Did you get it right? Catherine Newton. Congratulations. God, I'm good. Uh, last year, I watched Dracula and Frankenstein for the first time. Dracula? Yep. And so this year, I want to do Bride of Frankenstein uh, and then maybe one other Universal monster movie I haven't pulled out yet. Okay. Um uh, have you ever, I think you think you, you and I had this conversation off air um, when we're pretending to be friends mm-hmm. off air. Yeah, when um, you're threatening my life off exactly, air, off air instead of on air. Always. Um, you have not seen Halloween, right? I have not. I, I, look, it is a scary movie. I would highly recommend including the original John Carpenter's Halloween as well as the reboot from a few years ago. Yeah. Both the- named Halloween in the classic form of like a pseudo long delayed sequel to a horror film that has the same name as the horror film. Right. Yes. Yeah. I do want to watch that. I do want to watch, um, nightmare on Elm street. I was supposed to watch it last night. Okay. Uh, but <laughs> could not move. Yeah, that's fair. I, I've never seen the original. I've seen two, which is extraordinarily gay. Uh, we, that was like one of our, one of the, maybe that was in fact the last episode we did of gay it forward. Um, and I've seen the third one, which is kind of like weird. Um, but yeah, I've never seen the first one. And I've never, have you ever seen um, the original Friday the 13th? I've not. Okay, maybe we should watch some of these. Maybe we'll do some horror themed BFCs and, and catch up on some of these horror films. Good. Yeah, I would, I'd prefer to do those with a group. Yeah. I th- yeah, I think it's better. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, the thing is like, because you and I are both, neither of us are big horror genre people in general. Um, but I'm trying to make exceptions for movies that are actually like really, really good. Like m- movies that I feel like elevate themselves out of their own genre. Um, so I, I did watch recently The Exorcist. Um, mm-hmm. I've seen now most of the Conjuring films, the first two of which are really excellent. Um, the first two Paranormal Activities are also really, really good. That was the game changer. Yeah. yeah. Um, the movie was made for, what, $75,000? Something like that. It was absolutely, it's absolutely crazy. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I mean, there's some stuff in the second one that makes me think it might actually be better um, than the first one even. Um, what, else, what else is really good out there? I don't know if it counts. I don't know if it counts as horror. But have you ever seen Alien? I've not seen Alien. A- Alien is essentially a horror film, and then Aliens right. is an action movie. But Alien still holds up really, really well. It's really fucking creepy. Um, yeah, I got a list. We'll, okay, we'll try and hit some of these together. Yeah, there's yeah. some good stuff out there. I also um, 
since we now have all three streaming platforms for the main three animation channels of our of my childhood, right? Uh, I I have made a list of all of the Halloween specials I want to watch, <laughs> from you know between Disney Plus, Paramount Plus, and HBO Max. Mm-hmm. I'm very excited for all of them. Yes, I've never seen the Fresh Prince Halloween episodes. There's two of them. Really? Apparently, they're really cute. Yeah. Oh, so those, okay. Those, those are on my list. Uh, and and a handful of others that you don't care about. Absolutely not. Yep. That, don't give a shit. Um, wait, have we have we recorded since we watched Blockers? We've not. Okay, that's going to be one of my plugs this week. Oh, good. It's great. It's so good. I was surprised by how much I enjoyed it. It's, yes. It's so much better than it should be. Yeah, no, it, it honestly, it genuinely really is. Like, it is really, really funny, and it's got a lot of heart. Um, John Cena's just great. He's just, he's just so charismatic. And again, he, he's so good at, like, subverting his own machismo all the time. Yes, being the pacifist. Yeah. And, like... Every time the movie starts to dip into, like, really cringy, tropey, like, borderline misogynistic, borderline homophobic territory, it, like, points out that it's going that direction. Like, a character points out what's happening, like, kind of hang a lantern on it and recover it in a way that's actually pretty clever and funny. Um, I was genuinely surprised by how much I liked that movie. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the super quick rundown. Mm-hmm. It is the flipped trope of the like high school prom story. Yeah. It, it's basically like the, the, the flip on American Pie, where instead of like a bunch of guys decided they're going to all lose their virginity, it's a bunch of girls. Yes. They're all going to lose on prom night, and then the parents find out about it. And the, it, the movie is them doing their best to stop their daughters from having sex. Yes. It's really funny. It's so funny. <laughs> Just great cast, kind of great, like, supporting cameos all the way throughout, too. Um, yeah, it, it actually has, like, something really, like, sweet to say. Yeah. And and meaningful and, like, valuable to say, too. It actually, I think, adds something to the conversation around those kind of teen movies. So it's it's not quite as um, sophisticated as, say, Booksmart, but very little is. Right. So it, it's more of, like, your you're gonna hate me for saying this your classic studio comedy version of of that story <laughs> of that story rather than like yeah like the the more kind of like sophisticated teen dramedy that uh is book smart mm-hmm. but it's good though it's really good yeah yeah i would go check it out you really should um and then my other plug is i started watching succession <gasps> this last week how exciting it's good it is really good i mean it, it is like shakespeare with just despicable rich white people yeah um but it is really compelling, I have to say. And the performances are outstanding. I mean, uh, Brian Cox is one of my all-time favorite actors. I think he's incredible. Um, and he's just so, so good in this, as is everybody. Um, it's also a great showcase for Kieran Culkin, who has just, just this very particular kind of, like, weaselly snark. Yes, Wallace, for people who, who it, it, need a reference point. Exactly. Wallace from Scott Pilgrim. Yes, or uh, the cousin from Home Alone 1 and 2. Yes. Yes. I, d- I did not even realize that it's was Fuller, it. Fuller, who always wets the bed. That's hilarious. Yeah. Um, yeah. He, he he had a very very substantial glow up. Um, and he, he, I mean, everyone's really great in it, but it's it's really good. It's about halfway through the first season now. I'm, I'm doing my best to try and catch up before the season premiere, which is the 17th of October, I want to say. It's coming up here pretty soon. Um, okay. But it's good. It's all, it's all up on HBO Max, obviously. But yeah. Like, it's, I mean, it's a fantasy family, some loosely based off of. The, the Redstones and the Murdochs. Murdochs. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. So it's um, don't don't go in really expecting to like anybody. Yes, that is what I've heard. Yeah, but it's pretty compelling stuff. Mm-hmm. Good. I'll, I'll check it out eventually. Yeah. It's as I, I'm sure I've shared the story before. One of the characters is loosely based off my mom. Exactly. She used to <laughs> work for Sumner Redstone. <laughs> do, you, do you know which character? I'm assuming it's. Jerry, who runs the business. I'm I saying. think so. Do people, does like everyone hate her? No. Oh. Because the way my mom said it, it's the character that everyone hates. But uh, that didn't explain anything to me. Okay. I mean, everyone's kind of hateable. She's like the one character I kind of like. Maybe because I, I, I keep assuming it's based <laughs> off your mom, who I adore. So I'll, like, I'll take it. Yeah. I was like, oh, like, no, I love Jerry. <laughs> but no, I mean, if that is who it is, like, no, like, she's kind of like the one, like, competent reasonable person amongst then the, that can't the, be her, the, the whole she, brood she said they did not paint her in a good light <laughs> oh okay then maybe it's someone else then mm-hmm. um yeah I, I mean maybe she doesn't stay that way for the rest of the series but it's halfway through season one i'm like 
I like her. <laughs> She's good. She's maybe the only one in this thing who actually has the right ideas going forward. Yeah. Uh, but no, it's a good show. It's very, very good. Um, yeah, it's, it's like not like really heavy and intense, but it's also not light and fluffy at the same time. So, but yeah, it's pretty solid. Oh, but I think that does it for us this week. We did it. We with surprising amount of energy considering how tired we both are. Yeah, actually. Uh, but yeah, that wraps it up for this week. We will be back next week with uh, question authority and flashpoint. So Ooh, um, we're we're getting we're we're getting into like the real thrust of the Cadmus arc here. We're we're building towards uh, the finale and all this. It's really going to get crazy here. Um, but yeah, so that's coming up next week. Uh, and until then, you can find us at Tim Tuck Pond on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Gmail. Yes, you can yes. find me at Lordifer on Instagram. I will actually be posting some photos this week from my vacation to Maui. That's so exciting. Yes, I will actually be posting shit. How's he doing? Do you see Moana too? I d- <laughs> did not see Moana, but Maui was just as charming as ever. Uh, and as I was leaving, he just said, you're welcome. Good. So it was great. Good. <laughs> Uh, if you want to see my art, you can find that at Cameron.Dexter. If you want to see my face, you can find that at CamDexter underscore Adventures. Boom, boom, boom. Yes. All right. Well, uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. Uh, please continue to write in. And until next time, we'll see you then. See you then. Bye. I'm going to Disneyland. You're, you're, of course you're going to. I mean, what, what a fucking shock. <laughs> Cameron's on his way to Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay. I think I got it this time. Ready? You got it? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. I missed that. Shazam!